Hello and welcome to House Calls. I'm Vivek Murthy and I have the honor of serving as U.S. Surgeon General. I'd like to introduce you to Richard Reeves, a scholar who focuses on boys and men, inequality, and social mobility. Today we'll be talking about why men and boys are struggling in our society, in particular with their friendships and social connections. When you think about the boys and men in your life, whether they're family members, friends, colleagues, or maybe even yourself, how are they doing? I mean, how are they really doing? Do they have close relationships and people they can rely on? Are they thriving in the classroom or the workplace? Do they feel a sense of purpose? If you know a boy or a man who's having a hard time, my guest today, Richard Reeves, has some insights that can help us understand why. In this episode of House Calls, Richard and I talk about his most recent work, which examines the ways in which men and boys are profoundly struggling economically, socially, educationally, and in terms of their physical and mental health. As the lives of women have improved over the last 50 years, with changes such as Title IX, the lives of many men have remained the same or worsened, particularly for low-income men, says Richard. I know this is a complicated subject to discuss. Women and girls and people who identify outside of the gender binary, continue to face many challenges too. For example, women still earn only 82% of what men earn, a statistic that hasn't changed in 20 years, and they continue to be underrepresented in C-suite positions. My hope with this conversation is to pull the curtain back on the mental health and loneliness challenges affecting men and boys, challenges which have serious implications for all of us. In this conversation, we also get personal, speaking from our particular experience as fathers and husbands, and we reflect on the ways in which we've struggled with our roles and cultural expectations. Addressing hard problems often starts with having hard conversations. I hope my dialogue with Richard will spark more conversations about how we can build a future in which all people can be healthy, happy, and fulfilled. Richard, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Thank you, Vivek. I'm really looking forward to this. Richard, I must tell you that I have been following the conversation that your book has has catalyzed for the last, gosh, I don't know, a couple of months now. And it has been just fantastic to see on on so many levels. One, as I've told you uh, just a little while ago, you've given voice to a topic that I think many of us have been thinking about and been worried about, but haven't quite understood the data behind it, haven't known how to put put words uh, to what our concerns are, and certainly haven't known how to address it. Uh, And so I just want to commend you on starting a really important conversation about how boys are doing, how men are doing in society, because this is this is really a vital topic for us to tackle now. And and I'm eager to dig into it further with you. Well, thank you. Thank you for saying that. And I I will say that the framing of the conversation is is key. Uh, uh, What I sought to do was to open up a conversation about boys and men that in no way takes us away from ongoing concern about women and girls. And, 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 I, and one of the reasons that I sense people were struggling to talk about it wasn't because they couldn't see the, see some of the problems, but how do you talk about that in a way that doesn't seem to betray other commitments, especially to gender equality more broadly? And, and that's that, I think that zero-sum thinking is a problem in so many aspects of, of public life. And, and this was a particular one where I I felt that we weren't having a very good conversation about it. So I, 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 it means a lot to me that, that you found it helpful. Absolutely. And, and I, I like, you've said this in several of your interviews, which I, I find very uh, clear and compelling, which is that we should be striving to make sure that boys and girls are both doing well and that men and women are both doing well. And if either falls behind, then we have a problem and that impacts all of us. And, you know, just as I think that, you know, the well-being of men and boys uh, directly impacts, you know, women who are spouses, mothers, sisters, colleagues, etc. I think the opposite is true as well, and that's why I think uh, this is an issue: the well-being of men and boys that uh, women should care about, and I think similarly, men should absolutely not only care about but be involved in addressing uh, some of the key issues and challenges that women and girls have historically faced. So, uh, I'm glad that you're helping sh- shed light on this. This is an important part of the conversation. And, you know, as in the last couple of years, uh, you know, as I've served in in office, I've been focused a lot on uh, mental health and well-being, Richard, and in particular on on loneliness and social isolation. And I was wanted to start there uh, in, in talking to you about how men and boys in America are, are doing in terms of their mental health and well-being 
and particularly when it comes to issues of loneliness and isolation? Sure. Well, in return, I, I want to commend you for your emphasis on social connection, isolation, and mental health in, in your role. I actually believe now that stating these problems, acknowledging them, is in and of itself almost an intervention. You know, I think mm-hmm. we're, we're both probably quite wonky at heart. And sometimes we have this tendency to think, well, we'll figure out what the problem is and, I don't, and then we'll have some solutions. But in this particular space, I genuinely believe that naming the problem, acknowledging the mm-hmm. problem is part of, is, is substantively part of solving it because it makes people feel seen and, and, and mm-hmm. heard. And, and that's certainly been my experience just in naming what's happening with, with men. And so whilst your own work, you know this much better than I, that shows this growth in loneliness and isolation, disconnection, there are particular ways in which that seems to be affecting men in particular and young men. So if you look at work run out of the survey for the Center of American Life at, at AEI, you find that 15% of young men now say that they don't have a close friend. And that's up from 3% in 1990. Now it's risen at a similar rate actually for women, but is lower at 10%. So it's not that there isn't a problem for both, but that it's playing out more acutely in some ways for for men and for young men in particular. There is some evidence that after a relationship breakup, that men find themselves somewhat more socially isolated than women. So there, this could get into who's doing the relationship maintenance and so on. But so I think that's why one of the reasons why divorce seems to just hit men a bit harder psychologically and then of course there's all the evidence around so-called deaths of despair uh, the term coined by case and, and deaton where men are at three times greater risk and four times greater risk of suicide and i've been really troubled recently by the rise in the suicide rates among young men in particular aged between mm-hmm. 15 and 24 or jumped by eight percent just between 2020 and 2021 and so out of that there's a whole series of things going on there some of those are identifying subjective feelings of connection some of them are about outcomes in terms of despair and of course most tragically suicide but i think they all speak to ways in which this crisis is playing out somewhat differently in some cases and somewhat more sharply for a lot of young men uh, and boys and young men yeah, and this is so disturbing, and you, these discrepancies that you mentioned, particularly around deaths of despair, are really quite striking. I mean, in the United States, we are seeing declines in life expectancy, a phenomenon that we have not seen in decades and decades. Uh, and I do think these deaths of despair are key among the factors that are driving that. W- what is your sense of what is driving men uh, toward this isolation, this loneliness, and to greater rates uh, of, of suicide and medication overdose. Well, some of the changes that we've seen in society that you you documented in your in your own work around changes in em- employment are a big part of it. It's it's true that that employment has been a more important anchor of male identity and male connection historically, and and obviously we've seen huge changes in recent decades. But we are seeing more men who are detached from the labour market. So Nick Eberstadt and others have shown quite clearly that. There's just this long run problem with male labor force participation. And so you're seeing particularly men with lower levels of education becoming unanchored in one way or another from various institutions. That includes work, but it may also include then family, community life, church life, religious community and so on. And so I I think upstream of this are some of the economic shocks we've seen. But I think more broadly, and I'd love to know what you think of this idea, the male friendship is somewhat more institutionally created than female friendship, maybe because of different roles on reproduction, et cetera. But I think male male friendship is made in in activity. It's in it's in work. It might be through college, but of course college now skews almost 60, 40 female male. So I, I, I have this somewhat controversial thesis that male friendship is a little bit more fragile, a bit more constructed, takes a little bit more doing in some ways than female friendship does, perhaps because of the way we're socialized into creating friendships. And so as we've seen fewer men in the labor force, fewer men in college, certainly fewer men in religious institutions. I mean, there's there are more women in every church denomination virtually than men. And so all of those places, you, I've heard you talk a lot about the role of institutions, but those institutions right now have fewer men in them than women. And so it may just be we're seeing some of the consequences of that deinstitutionalization of friendship, which is particularly affecting men. 
It's a really interesting point. You know, it, it, I think there's some, there's really something to that because I you know I remember some years ago um, studying the men's sheds movement, mm. uh, which you may be familiar with. Yeah, which started in Australia, and in and in talking to the the woman actually who founded the men's sheds movement, um, she told me that in those early days they had this saying that. Uh, you know, and again, this doesn't necessarily apply to everyone, but this, their saying was, "Women talk face to face, and men talk shoulder to shoulder." And her, and her point was, what, it was your point that men often build their friendships while they're doing something together, uh, whether that's something recreational, whether that's working together, whether it's a service uh, project uh, that they're a part of in their community. Um, but their conversation happens in the course of activity, uh, and often not entirely for its own sake. And I do think that that has real implications because when there are fewer, it's not just when there are fewer opportunities, I think, for activity in the community or at work, but also when recreation uh, has changed so much as it has, when you can just stay home and, and watch movies yourself and not have to necessarily go out and be with other people. That just, all of these have a cumulative effect on reducing the opportunities for physically being together, doing things together. And I do think that it has a, a profound impact on how men dialogue. Right. I, th I think since you're bringing it up, there's also an interesting piece around culture that I'm, I'm curious to ask you about, which is um, you've written about how, from just from a cultural perspective, we, we have different expectations uh, of men and women, of dads and mothers, um, we, of how we assess value, frankly, uh, to uh, a, a man. And you've brought up the, I think, important idea that some of these ideas that a man's worth is about whether or not uh, he's the breadwinner uh, in the family, and uh, that th that perhaps is an antiquated notion uh, that we need to to liberate ourselves from, which I I think is really interesting to consider. Um, but I wonder how much culture plays into this as well, into how uh, men and uh, form friendships, and frankly, into the mindset then and uh, suggestions that are given to young boys as they grow up about what's appropriate in terms of expressing. Uh, their feelings towards uh, others, to like, actually taking initiative, uh, to you know, building friendships uh, with other boys. But I'm curious how, how, what you think the impact of culture is on the nature of friendship formation among men and boys. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thought that to some extent, if if male friendship is somewhat more activity based, this shoulder to shoulder point, which I largely agree with, with all the usual caveats about averages and overlapping mm -hmm. distributions. But I'm going to assume anyone listening to this podcast understands what an overlapping distribution looks like and understands that we're talking averages here. If that's true, then to some extent, the clarity of the male role and especially the breadwinner role and the role in the labor market sort of did the work for men. To mm -hmm. some extent, those relationships were formed semi-automatically through, in particular, the workplace or the training towards that workplace. And then maybe there would be other social relationships through family, et cetera. I'm thinking about my own childhood and you know, it's quite clear that my mom would be do, do more of the sort of social networking kind of in our community, but my, my father had his friends not trivially through work. And if that's no longer or so semi-automatically true, it does mean that men will have to work a bit harder than we've previously had to, and maybe from a lower skill base. I think we have generally have a slightly lower skill base than we're used to. And and we could be in a cultural lag moment where we haven't, if you like, upskilled relationally to compensate for the loss of some of that semi-automatic creation of relationships that used to come just through the role, you know, as a father and as a breadwinner. But I'll also say that our sense of identity is still quite asymmetric. And so what women have done uh, is to add new uh, palettes, if you like, to their, to their identity, no, new colors rather, to their identity palette. So being an, a worker is now n the norm, right, for women in a way that it wasn't before, but still strong identity from being a mom, from being part of the community, et cetera. So a bit more of a mixed portfolio, if you like, whereas it's still true that men put more of their identity eggs in the basket of work. I'm probably I'm mixing my metaphors in a way that's unforgivable <laughs> right now. I've got, <laughs> totally I've, I've got, we've got eggs and pallets, so someone someone will clean this up, no doubt. But but uh, but it's this idea of like I don't I don't think we as men have broadened yet our sense of ourselves to fit with this new world uh, where we 
shouldn't and don't get this automatic identity almost scripted for us through the breadwinner role. Yeah, and what do you think it'll take to change that? Time. I'm a big believer that you know, it's cultural change doesn't typically happen that quickly, especially when it's around something as profound as this. And this has been a very rapid change in the economic role of men. So just mm. a couple of data points. In 1979, 13% of women earned more than the typical man. So the guy at the median, 13%. Now it's 40%. We've seen a quadrupling in the same period in the share of breadwinners who are women. It's now 40% of breadwinners are women. So these are profound and positive changes in the economic power and position of women. But it also has these downstream consequences. Well, what does that mean for men then? And I particularly think that what's been lost is in danger of being lost is the sense of fatherhood. I know there's something you're yes. very interested in too, that fatherhood used to have something more of a, it was more like an indirect relationship. You know how in an org chart you get like dotted line relationships? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. It's, I think father, father to child is a bit more like that. So you got a direct line from mother to, to child, direct line from father and mother to each other, and then more of a dotted line relationship from from dads to kids. In other words, it was a and it was mediated through the mum to some extent, right? But in a world where forty percent of children are born outside marriage, in a world where there's much more economic equality in terms of breadwinning role, we've got to reconfigure fatherhood, and. I don't think we've done a good enough job, candidly, as culturally or as policymakers, of really pushing hard on the ideal of responsible and engaged fatherhood. So to be unfair to both sides for a moment, the right tend to say, sure, you can be a good dad if you're married. But sometimes those on the left are almost reluctant to admit that dads matter independently from mothers because they feel that will be heteronormative or somehow to, to you know, to be in some way disrespectful of same-sex couples or of single mothers or, or whatever. I understand those concerns, but, but the danger is that we are, we are missing an opportunity to send a message to fathers of all kinds, you matter. And even if you're not in a job, even if you're not making any money, even if you're struggling, even if you've got your own mental health problems, your kids need you, period. Gosh, it's, uh, there's so many important points you raised there. I think one of them, I think you're right that culture change absolutely takes time. And and I'm thinking about, even in my own life, about how I've thought about myself as a father. And I will say that, you know, early in my career, when I, actually around the time that I first became a dad, um, I was actually, it's interesting, I, I was serving as Surgeon General when I had uh, my first child. Um, and my wife and I were very excited. You know, we're, we're having our son. We wanted to build, build this new family and this new life. But I was also in a circumstance where, to, to our best recollection when we did our research, there hadn't been a Surgeon General in modern history who had had a child while in office. There's questions of, like, what do you do around parental leave? You know, we're coming up, et cetera. And there was a part of me, if I'm honest, that that felt like, taking parental leave, even though I knew intellectually it was the right thing to do, there was a part of me, the part that had been acculturated to think that my primary role or most important responsibility was work, a part of me felt some guilt around that and maybe even some shame at taking time off from work uh, to be with family. And you know, I, I was able to see that that's not how I want to operate and not who I want to be, and so change I needed to make. So I did take, uh, you know, uh, parental leave at the time. I think I took around three weeks of parental leave, um, and it was incredibly valuable for me. Uh, I hope it was helpful uh, to to my w wife, and that I wasn't just in the way. Uh, and I hope it was ultimately helpful to my to my my baby uh, boy as well. Um, and I wouldn't trade that like for anything. But but it was clear to me that there was there was. There was some internal conflict there that I was working through. That was a result of some of the, uh, the you know, the cultural norms that I had inherited, you know, and absorbed uh, from society more broadly. And I, I would love for us to get to a place where parents, whether they're moms or dads, don't have to to think that somehow taking parental leave means that they are uh, less of a mom or less of a dad or less of a man uh, or less of a woman. Um, but I also think that if we truly believe that being a parent is one of the most important roles that you can play in life in terms of shaping a child and shaping society for the future, 
then we should be lifting up uh, the role of mothers and fathers, supporting those roles, encouraging people to take the time they need and to invest in in those roles, um, even if that means sometimes that that comes you know, at the expense of how many hours they may put in at the office. Yeah, and and to recognize that there will be a trade-off, but that we can, yeah. between, between work and, and family, but that we can A, make that trade-off less through reforming our labor market institutions. It's, ex- it's sort of extraordinary how unreformed our labor market institutions are, given that it's the norm now for both parents to work. I, I find that quite quite amazing in some ways that we're just still too slow and I, one of the things I think is that we've we've always been promised. I'm in my fifties now, and my my three sons are all in their twenties. And so I took time I took time out to be to be the stay at home parent for a while, and you know flexed work and so on too. So I've I've lived through some of these similar experiences. It, it probably helped that I served in the Conservative Liberal Democrat coalition government in the UK, where it's within weeks of becoming prime minister, David Cameron took paternity leave, uh-huh. uh, and. and very similar to your situation that's incredibly important kind of cultural moment but you know we're always promised family friendly work what i fear we try and end up creating is work friendly families in Ah. other words what we do is we say look we need full-time childcare. we need breakfast clubs we need isn't it inconvenient that the school day doesn't fit the working day but rather Hmm. than saying well let's change the working day all too often our instinct is to extend the school day um rather than the, the other way around but i'll say one thing about parenting is i don't know your kids are still relatively young then if i've done my math correctly they are they're five and six right yes so it's a long it's also a long haul raising kids and i'm slightly worried the the taking of paternity leave or parental leave very early on important though it is is in no way a substitute for the long game Right, <laughs> right. It takes absolutely decades to raise children. You know, people say it'll be over before you know it. That's not true. Mm-hmm. Public health warning: it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a long time, and it's wonderful and joyous. And if my sons are listening, I loved almost every minute of it. Um, and so, what I fear is that we miss the fact that adolescence, for example, is a hugely important time for kids, mm. and it looks like it's a period where dads might actually bring something a little bit different to the party. Hmm. There's some evidence, I don't want to overstate it, but some evidence that actually that adolescent period, actually having more engagement from dad is good for both boys and girls. And hmm. so my brother, for example, he took his, he's in the UK, but he took his parental leave when his boys turned 14. He has twin boys. Because he felt How that was, you know, it took some time before yeah. that. Which, actually, this is when I'm going to make the most impact as a dad, right? When they're going into high school, they're figuring all that out. There's raging hormones, etc. And I think he was right. And and there's a bit of a danger of early, year, early years determinism in some of the policy debates here. And so one of the things I think we should do is be very flexible about when you can take leave and allow parents mm. to be taking it through, throughout the decades that it takes to raise leave. And, and not least for dads. So it's great that you took your time. But as you know, it's not over yet. And it won't be over for you for a very long time. In fact, it's never over. Um, and so you may well want to take a step back eight years from now. And that could be great. And public policy should support that choice. It's such a, a critical point you just brought up because you're right. It, it is a long haul, and there are times where we're going to need more uh, time with our kids, like you said, during adolescence, and or if they're in a crisis or if they have a health issue. And I've, I've often wondered what is at the center of our lives. Uh, we, if you, if I were to stop 100 people on the street, Richard, and ask them, what are the top three priorities in your life? I guarantee you, a relative, a child, you know, a best friend would be in that in that priority list. Yet when we somehow look at the lives that we all lived, I find that they aren't always people-centered lives. They're often work-centered lives, right? And then we fit people in where it's convenient. Um, But especially when it comes to our kids, I think to be able to flex our, the rest of our life, including work around our families, uh, strikes me as being incredibly important if we truly want our kids to be well, if we want the next generation to be strong. And, um, I think it's just too hard for too many families right now to do that. They're fighting against the tide. Yeah. Uh, Because as you mentioned, society has not caught up, I think, to matching, um, you know, what it it currently has with what we need, which is a truly people uh, and family-centered life. Yeah, I was was super impressed that the U.S. military has introduced three months of paid leave for both mothers and fathers, 
technically birthing and non-birthing parents. And like, what, what, uh, so, uh, what about civilians? Uh, mm -hmm. Now I know we need Congress for that, but it, it seems to me like if people serving our country in the military and it's equal, it's equal leave. Um, I think that's an incredibly powerful signal. But also, as your your own work shows, it is these other social networks. So there's family and work, but there's also all those interstitial institutions, the social infrastructure that is so important and that your own your own work and your own recent note um, points out. And I worry a lot about the decline of after school activities for this reason, mm. right? So let's take school as analogous to work, right? And friendship mm. for teenagers and so on as analogous to families or more broadly. One of the things that I think is great about extracurricular, and here I will talk particularly about boys, is the opportunity, like maybe you're struggling in the classroom, of course, you know, boys are a bit more likely to be struggling in the classroom, but having that, having that figure of the coach, having the opportunity to go and be shoulder to shoulder, engaged in some kind of activity, it's terribly important. And so the rise of pay to play extracurricular, the decline in the share of coaches, the decline in those activities, is a different kind of work-life balance problem, right? Let's call it a school friend problem. And of course you can make friends in the classroom, but but those extra those extracurricular activities are getting are becoming more associated with class, more associated with affluence, right? So you have very, very busy the kids of, of rich parents are very busy after school. That's much less true of lower income kids. And it's less true of boys than of girls. I that's like if we're serious about loneliness, we're serious about friendship, we're serious about developing relational skills, we shouldn't treat extracurricular as an afterthought. In some ways, after school activities are the opposite of an afterthought. They're central to the development of these skills and relationships, right? Oh, I, I couldn't agree more. And in fact, I would say those kind of recreational after-school activities shouldn't be extracurricular, they should be curricular. They should be part of how we think about uh, the foundation for learning. Because you know, we put so much emphasis, I think, on reading and writing and uh, making sure our kids can do math and learn history. But what, we know that one of the most powerful determinants of whether a child succeeds or not uh, in not just in school, but in life, in the workplace, in the future, are the relationships they build, the secure attachments they develop, uh, and if, and I think also like I think it's become very clear that kids don't just automatically have the skills to understand their emotions, to understand the emotions of others, to manage emotions, and to build healthy relationships, especially in a very complex world that they live in and are growing up in, where social media has fundamentally changed. Uh, how kids experience their relationships in the world. So, yeah, I, I think that that kind of social emotional learning is should be a key part of education. And the kind of extracurricular activities, what's traditionally been extracurricular that you're talking about, especially unstructured playtime, I think is really uh, vital. I think that's where so many uh, young people over the generations have learned how to negotiate uh, difficult situations and build relationships and uh, and manage. Uh, you know, conflict and stress on the playground, you know, or uh, building things or, you know, working on projects uh, with other kids. And I worry, Richard, that when I talk to young people today, especially in elementary school and middle school, uh, but especially in during adolescence and middle school and high school, they say that even when they're in school, a lot of times they're not talking to one another with their full attention. They're distracted by their phones. People are uh, using their devices throughout the school day. And you know that takes away from the the richness of human interaction, and and often I think dilutes uh, the power of the relationships that w we can build. Yeah, those relational skills are taught much more in the doing, aren't they? Than in the so you know I think about my own kids so, than how they would describe their their classes on they'd have classes on learning how to be respectful, hmm. and they would they would roll their eyes, and it wasn't that the teachers weren't trying to do their thing, but but the way you learn how to be respectful and communicate well is not with a class, especially with 12 year old boys, a class on how to be respectful and communicate. What you do is you, you do it. Kids believe their eyes rather than their ears. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. that is why through these activities, it's, it's usually important to learn them. And it's one of the reasons I've become, if anything, even more obsessed with the decline in the share of teachers who are male than, mm. uh, than when I wrote my book. Because that since I wrote the book, I first of all, the declines continued. But but I've discovered that men in men in schools, in K-12 schools, also do quite a lot of coaching. They're much more likely to do coaching. Now, there's all kinds of reasons that could be true, of course. It may be that they don't have the same family responsibilities that female teachers do. So there may well be 
gender inegalitarian reasons behind it. But one of the consequences is that as we see fewer and fewer men in our classrooms, it's down to 23% of K-12 teachers now who are male, um, down from 33% and dropping, is we have fewer coaches, especially of male sports, of boys' sports. You might not think that sounds like a big deal, but I think it is quite a big deal, especially in mm. the schools where the kids are lowest income. You only have to think about you know, the idea of Friday night lights or the the cultural role of coach right and so i'm an Im- i'm an immigrant uh, but the, mm. the role of of coach is almost iconic in american society and that's for a really good reason right that the 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 figure of the especially for the boys who maybe don't have a strong father figure in their lives or are struggling to make their way in the world the coach is such an important figure and so i actually think we need something like a coach for america campaign or something mm. to to increase the share of people. we also got a lot of young men trying to figure out what to do so maybe there's some way in which we could construct a policy here which sort of brings brings those two problems together in a way but one thing i'm sure about is that we're currently under coaching our kids and especially our young boys and young men that's a fascinating idea a coach for america mm. campaign i really like that and i I especially like your point that it could give young men an opportunity to step up and be mentors and guides for uh, for younger boys, uh, which I think could be very powerful. So, Richard, you've talked about your sons a, a few times, and and I actually I want to understand a little bit about how you got on, into this subject. I know that your own family is a key part of this, but tell us a little bit about your personal journey to exploring the state of boys and men. Yeah, I have this theory that. All of our work is at least partly autobiographical. It's just a question of whether we acknowledge that or not. It comes from <laughs> somewhere. And in this case, there's, there's no doubt that talking to my sons about the challenges in school and growing up in this, in this world today and what it, discussions about masculinity on the online world that they were in, gaming, etc., was just a constant theme. And then in my day job at Brookings, where I was working mostly on class and economic inequality and racial inequality, I, I kept I kept stumbling over these data points where it's like, oh, the, the boys are doing quite badly. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. And and, it, and then I'd bring those back home and we'd discuss them. Uh, and so it became my journey as a father trying to raise boys to be not only to be good feminists, because I think if we define that term correctly, we we're, we should all be aiming to do that, but also to be good men. And and I, I wasn't entirely sure how to do that. I wasn't sure exactly what the script was. We've already talked a bit about our own. We're all having to adjust and adapt. And 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 the result of that, what I realized was that I didn't. I, I thought too many of the conversations people were having around their dinner table were not being had in the open, weren't being had in public, and so that led me to say, I think we should be having more of a public conversation about what's happening to to boys and men and not just be talking about it at the school gate or or around the dinner table and they've you know in different ways had all kinds of struggles now i want to be clear that they're white upper middle class boys so they're not the ones we should be most concerned about from an equity point of view but nonetheless they gave me a lens through which to look at the world which was very different so I'll give you one example i i really struggled to persuade them that there used to be a time when men were ahead of women in education and when you know really because the only world they've known is one where the girls yeah. just handing it to the boys in the classroom they just they just presume that education is absolutely a female you know an area of female dominance and they're like no it didn't used to be like that and they're like really I'm like, so i'm going to give them a history lesson <laughs> and it's like, yeah that but, is like, fascinating like huh. five minutes like five minutes ago we're women over to roughly speaking and you know you only have to go back to your grandparents generation and it was a, very unusual for women to go to college like oh really okay that makes mm. sense that is so interesting. You mentioned that part of what you had to figure out was how to talk to your sons about masculinity. And can I ask you, um, you know, and to whatever extent you feel comfortable sharing, how did you talk to your sons about masculinity? And how did you define that? How did you paint a picture for them of what masculinity meant? I hope in the end it was more it was more painting a picture than telling a story. You know, back to my earlier claim that you know kids especially believe their eyes, not their ears. But to be to be completely honest, I think my 
failure to really engage with that question properly is one of the things that led me to tr a try and get better at it and b to start exploring it with a more of a policy wonk um hat on at the brookings institution <laughs> so in some ways i'm sort of hiding behind the charts and the data and the studies right that's what you put out there that's the public persona is the the wonk but behind it is you know to some extent a a failed father and a, a failed husband. And I mean failed in the sense of just, I think it took me a long time to try and square this circle of a commitment to gender equality, to being absolutely on side with you know, my wife's career, with the move towards you know a, a more gender equal future, and also still being a guy. And for too long, I felt that there was this almost inescapable trade-off between those two things and i thought that to be a better feminist i had to be less of a guy and i had mm. to, that my masculinity was almost the problem so rather than being something i was trying to pass on to my sons it was almost something for a while i was trying to expunge hmm. and that led me down some inter very interesting paths in my own journey but and I realized it was uh, going to war with yourself is not great psychologically. And what ended up in this place is like, actually, you, you don't have to stop being you in all, a, in all of the wonderful variety of human experience. And so I've tried to show and teach my boys that it's just, it's okay to be different. And in some cases, being different in the classroom or being different, you know, out on the sports field or even just in the way we joke with each other is a bit more stereotypically masculine mm. that's okay it's okay as long as it doesn't come into conflict with a commitment to supporting each other and so in the end i think the fact that they just saw me staying at home the fact that i was the one picking them up from school and taking them to school and organizing their play dates for quite a few years <laughs> spoke more volumes than anything else it's just doing it rather than saying it that probably amounted to it. but i'll be honest i'm sharing more with you than i plan to but but i think for too many men we have felt like to be on side with the forces of progress, we somehow have to miniaturize our own sense of ourselves as men. And to a degree that makes us different to women. Uh, and I, I personally struggled with that, but I wonder if there isn't a little bit of that going on more generally in our culture. Oh, wow. I mean, that was very incredibly powerful, Richard, what you just shared. And thank you for that honesty. Um, I think you're absolutely right that there are many people out there who are struggling with the right balance here and trying to figure out how to be who they want to be without detracting from the well-being and the opportunities that their partner has. And, you know, I've struggled with this as well, too. You know, I, I have a close friend, uh, you know, close circle, I should say, of, of guy friends, and we talk often about what does it mean to be truly equitable in a relationship? Uh, to actually make sure that our spouses have the right opportunities, the opportunities they want, uh, that they have the time to pursue other interests, to be with their friends, that the that all of the responsibility for childcare is not falling on them. Like we talk a lot about this concept of equity, but it is challenging. It's it's not as simple as saying everything is fifty fifty, you know. Or um, and sometimes it comes into conflict with with our own sense of what it means to to be a man. And then we have to pick that apart and dissect that and try to understand how much of that is who we really are, how much of that is, you know, constructs or social uh, norms that we've taken on, you know, from our parents and from prior generations. I think one of the, and this is hard work, I think, to figure this out. I think one of the things that makes it particularly hard though, Richard, is it feels to me at least that we don't, talk openly about this enough that we aren't able to grapple with it in you know in conversation even with friends much less publicly because uh, there are so many landmines around here that people are worried about uh, you know stepping on uh, that it it creates a a silence that I think is actually not helpful and I'm, I'm wondering if you have sensed something similar and how if if you have how do you think we should address that silence and create more healthy dialogue not just among men but uh, between men and women on this topic? Well, I think your diagnosis is right, Vivek, that there is something of a fear of a discussion around this. And it's one of the ways in which I think those male-only spaces might be useful in a very new way to the, to, the, to the old way. And so we shouldn't 
necessarily be skeptical of them. And I think people of good faith are able to hold the thought that we can be somewhat different on average as men and women without that in any way determining who we're going to be and without in any way dishonoring the exceptions uh, to that rule and to acknowledge that without overweighting it. Right now, it feels almost as if, weirdly, the silence around these dis these these issues of masculinity, say, doesn't actually create more progress. In some ways, it creates the conditions for a backlash. So if you look at, you know, the survey evidence now is that sort of 50% of American men think that men are being punished just for acting like men. But there is a sense that actually the claim that kind of mainstream society that is somehow against men has become anti-men or whatever starts to just ring a bit too plausibly in the ears, particularly vulnerable, lonely, isolated young men. So this is coming full circle here. If you're an isolated young man and you're not acting out the relationships with other men in real life, you're much more susceptible to the, to the online ministrations of folks who are just queuing up to tell you that, yes, you are struggling, which is true. And the reason for that is because feminists and the cultural left hate you and they mm. want to leave you behind, which is not true. But our failure to discuss these problems openly creates that vacuum. And it is an axiom, I think, of cultural life that if there are real problems that are not being addressed by responsible people, irresponsible people will always exploit them. Richard, I, I want to talk for a moment about technology. Uh, we've touched on the fact that kids growing up today do have fundamentally different experiences in part because of the prevalence and the nature of social media and technology more broadly. But And you've written about this, about how technology is affecting kids. Can you say a little bit about how it is affecting boys as they grow up and, and men in young adulthood? Yeah, well, you, you don't need me to tell you that there is a youth mental health crisis you've made that one of your signature themes uh, in your in your tenure and that it is undoubtedly related in various complex ways to this techno technological shock that that we've seen what i'm interested in is the way that it plays out somewhat differently again on average between between the genders and that's partly because actually you know boys and girls young men and young women are engaging with technology in different ways and on different mm -hmm. platforms right and so i've seen it in my own sons obviously video gaming and discord is a much bigger deal and we can't not mention online pornography uh, all of which are just much more male skewed whereas the social the more social social media like TikTok, Instagram, et cetera, is somewhat mm. skewed female. And so actually I've come to believe, and here is Jonathan Haidt, Carol Dweck, uh, Jean Twenge and others, more Jean probably, I think bears some of this out, that it's not just that the technology shock is different in degree in terms of girls and boys, but maybe in kind. And what I mean by that is that it looks to me that you see this huge issue for teen girls in particular, and it's in the recent CDC report and everywhere that you see this rise in concerns about body image, concerns about mental health, et cetera. And part of that, I think, is because of the way that, that girls are using technology, which play into issues around body image, right? The visuals, like very visual forms of technology, but also relationally, actually, now, I'll just quote other people as saying that, like, it's not that boys and girls bully each other any less, it's that girls tend to do it more relationally, again, on average, mm. less physically. Now, you could argue that some of these more relational forms of social media are, can be weaponized and they can make you feel really bad, right? Who likes me? Am I in or am I out? Best friends, not friends, cliques, et cetera. The, you know, at the risk of offending people, they're almost like the mean girls phenomenon online right? Amplified on this massively amplified. Whereas for boys, I think it's more a problem of displacement and retreat. I think it's less that what the boys are doing online is as problematic in itself. I think it's more, and you refer to this earlier Vivek around recreation, what they're not doing instead, that it's replacing in real life mm. relationships, in real life activities, rather than in and of itself being as harmful. So weirdly, I think this whole debate about screen time you know, how much, how many hours should your kids be on on a screen is this big debate. I think it might vary a little bit by the sex of the child. Um, mm -hmm. And so for boys, actually, actually, it might we we might worry a bit less about what they're doing. And that's a blanket statement, but 
and more just like why aren't you doing something else uh because it's too easy to retreat it's given boys a place to go whereas with girls i think it's a bit more actively harmful so i don't know and i can't it's very hard to sustain mm. that and um, statistically but but my sense is that we should be very attentive to the ways in which these tech the technology shop might be playing out differently and i think that for boys it's more likely to be driving this isolation this loneliness this disconnection and this retreat from the in real life interactions whereas i think for girls it may well be actually providing this kind of much more real time sense of you know damage damage to self through relationships and through self image i certainly think we should be mm. we certainly shouldn't assume that it's the same for both i don't I, i think we've got reason to believe that it's quite different for both which might mean that our approaches need to be somewhat more gendered yeah no i, I think that's a, a very astute point and it it also highlights why it's so important for us to actually study this more and get the data from uh, technology companies and platforms uh that our kids are using so that we understand uh how this is actually ultimately impacting them and i know that uh, something we we pointed out recently in a, a product we put out on social media is that researchers across the board say they're having a hard time getting the data that they need from uh technology companies uh, about the impact on the mental health of young people and that to me is is a fundamental problem like i as a parent i certainly don't want to feel like information is being hidden from me uh, about the impact of the products my kids are using on their health and their well-being. I I want to actually ask you also about just about willingness to talk about emotions. This is an area where um you know Naomi Way who I think you're probably familiar with and some of her wonderful research uh you know at NYU uh, has suggested that girls and boys actually may have actually a lot of similarity in how they talk about emotions very early in childhood um uh, but then a divergence takes place you know around early adolescence um where you know young boys stop feeling so comfortable talking about uh their emotions or expressing uh love or affection uh toward their friends especially if those friends are other boys and i, I was curious if you have any thoughts on one on this challenge with actually speaking to emotions and expressing uh affection and friendships uh that perhaps many you know, boys and and men experience and if you have a sense of where that might be coming from yeah as with all these questions it's very hard to tease out impossible to tease out the effects of socialization from what might be some you know genuine differences in in the development uh of boys and girls and but in some senses it doesn't matter where it comes from if we know that having an ability to relate emotionally and share our emotions is important right what it might mean is that we have to work a little bit harder with our boys and that policy makers might have to work a little bit harder to reach men who are struggling you know it's very striking to me that there's a 10 percentage point gap in the share of men and women getting mental health treatment now hmm. maybe there's a 10 percentage point gap in the share of men and women that need mental health treatment but i don't see it in the other data right and so so to some extent i do think that finding ways that are more male friendly to get boys and men to be able to express how they're feeling like, through activities through language that's more comfortable to them in spaces maybe even including a few male only spaces where it's kind of easier to do that i i i do feel like it's sometimes harder especially for adolescent boys to open up in that way when there are girls around. Mm -hmm. And why that's true could be the source of research for the until the end of days, but if it's true, let's just acknowledge that and try to create some spaces where where they are able to do it. And then the other thing is there's this great campaign kind of back in the UK and it was a mental health campaign and it was it was it was ask it was something like always ask twice. And the idea mm -hmm. behind the campaign was if you ask a guy how are you, he'll say fine. Uh, okay how are you did you watch the football whatever you know stereotyping horribly here but so always ask again always ask now how how are you really what's really going on ask twice whereas you get the sense with women they don't maybe need the second prompt as often that actually if you ask them how they're doing they're more likely to say well actually I'm really struggling a bit with my daughter or whatever right but the guys do mm -hmm. need that kind of additional nudge maybe or additional permission to just have work a little work a little bit harder and we could just roll our eyes at this point and say well that's men for you that you know so poor them etc i i think that would lack compassion i think we have to at least for the we have to treat boys and men where they are 
And so our services and our approach should just be somewhat more compassionate towards them. And I will say, and I don't know if you've had this experience, but this speaks to the idea of just naming things, being powerful. Mm. And I've been writing about loneliness and you talk beautifully about your own experience and I've been writing about friendship. Mm. People come up to you. I had, a, I had a, a young man who was actually a colleague of mine at Brookings come up to me after I'd written and done some videos around this idea of friendship and so on in tears, putting his arms around me, thanking me and just saying, I'm so lonely. And it's so great to hear that, you know, that I'm not the only one that's lonely and that you and that you see me. And I've just put my arms around this guy. You know, I want to adopt him at this point, of course. But just, And all I've done is what you're doing so well, which is just to say this is real. This is a real problem. And by the way, it's a real problem for a lot of young men. And I, and I honestly think a lot of the figures kind of on maybe on the more conservative side of this, especially online, one of the reasons they're able to attract young men is simply saying, I see you, I get it, you are struggling and your suffering and your struggling are every bit as important to me as anybody else's. You are as precious to me as anybody else. And that's an incredibly powerful thing to do, but we shouldn't be allowing you know, figures in the manosphere or online or to be the only one saying to struggling young men or lonely young men, we got you, we see you, we're here for you. That turns out to be incredibly powerful just to just to say that there's this line from a poet who I love, David White. I don't know if you know he's a British poet. And he's that line yeah. and he has a beautiful poem on friendship and he describes friendship in part as the privilege of being seen. Being seen. Yeah. That's actually one of my favorite um, favorite lines and pieces of wisdom from David White. And I think that's absolutely true. And it it reminds me of what struck me so much back in 2015 when I was beginning my first tenure as Surgeon General and traveling around the country and talking to people about what was on their mind, what was bothering them. And so many people, young people in particular, conveyed this sense of feeling invisible, of feeling like if they disappeared tomorrow, nobody would even notice or care. And that that is an incredibly destructive feeling. Uh, I think I've always felt that we all have uh, three basic needs as human beings, regardless of what culture we come from. We all um, we all want to be seen and understood for who we are. We all want to know that we matter, and we all want to be loved. And those three things are deeply interconnected. And sometimes just being able to, as you said, acknowledge what someone is going through, being able to sit and listen to them, which is one of the most powerful ways of acknowledging that they matter, uh, that they have significance, that can go a long way toward helping people uh, feel seen. But there, it is, it is very painful to see that so many people don't feel that way. Um, I'll share with you one story that I that I encountered recently. There's a uh, there's a, a a doctors group, you know, online that um, uh, that I you know I'm, I'm part of, and and people post sometimes questions they have about medical. Uh, you know, diagnoses about treatment decisions, and and it's a wonderful community where people are helping each other uh, think through medical uh, questions and often dilemmas. But from time to time, people also will share other uh, questions of a more personal nature to to get people's advice or help on. And there's this one uh, doctor, uh, a young man, who wrote. He said, "You know, my wife and I had a child uh, recently, and." It seems to, and it's been a very intense experience. He's like, I, I'm trying to do everything I can to make sure I'm there, you know, that I'm not an absent dad, that I'm uh, taking the time that I need from work to, to be there for my kid and for, for my wife. He said, but one thing I've noticed is that this has been really hard for both of us, but every time my wife mentions uh, that she had a baby recently, it seems like other women step up and offer to help or ask her if she needs anything. They offer their support. Whereas he was reflecting that in his own experience, he, he has received very little, if any, uh, even acknowledgement from the men that he works with, uh, that he had a child or asking about how's it going or uh, supporting him like in this new experience of fatherhood that he's going through. And he was just reflecting on this that discrepancy. And uh, he was grateful that his wife found support, but he was wondering, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with the people around me? Is there something about men and guys that prevents us or precludes us from offering and extending the kind of support that we may be too ashamed to ask for, but the truth is we all really need. Uh, 
And I was curious if you had any reactions to to that story. I suspect you may have heard similar ones. Uh, yes, you know, in your own yes. time, and, and and had related experiences when I was when I was the primary care for my my own children. There is a, a there's a social infrastructure for mothers in particular that pre you know usually can start with the classes before and then afterwards. And so to some extent, I think that's one one thing that women have going for them is the creation of some of those relationships around that moment of reproduction. And now that men are less detached from, you know, the old days you might, what do you do? You turn up, have a cigar and a whiskey if you're from a particular kind of culture, and then off you go back to work the next day. Given that fathers are now thankfully much more involved and that becoming a father is so important. And by the way, the survey evidence shows that men aren't far behind women in saying how that it's the most important part of their identity to, mm. to be a dad. It means that we need to do better at creating solidarity for those men. But I, I wonder if it doesn't have to be partly male solidarity as well. And you've talked about the female solidarity that your colleague's wife got. And it, it needs to be father-to-father -father solidarity, I believe, mm -hmm. because it is somewhat different, like especially in those early days, clearly different experiences, right? And so I think just having other dads who've been through it showing similar levels of solidarity to the to the way that mums do to other mums and it make and it brings me to a broader point which is i think part of the problem this whole debate about boys and men is that sometimes the women who are very often working in the institutions that might be most involved they might be brave enough to say are you kidding me we just spent we spent decades helping trying to get women and girls i've still got my hands full helping women and girls seriously we're not it's not women's job to solve men's problems. Now, of course, it's everybody's job to solve everybody's problems. And as you said earlier, we do have to rise together. But, but I think a reasonable critique to people like us is it's up to us as men to both figure out what it means to be a man in this modern world and try to live that out and pass that on, but also to be there for each other. There's still a bit of a tendency for us to outsource some of that emotional labor and still see it to some extent as women's work, right? Mm. You even see like, and this would be a bit of a critique of the, of the administration, is that the place where you find men's health issues being addressed is at the Office of Women's Health. And sometimes it will say, as mothers and wives, of course, we're worried about the health of our husbands and sons. And so read this piece here, right? So it's still mm. even, it, even in government circles, men's health is sometimes seen as a subset of women's health, which kind of by implication says it's women's work. It's not. It's men's work and it's up to all of us to step into that role and learn from what women have done. But like, I, I know that you're, you're obviously there for your friend and for your guy and you've needed people to be there for you uh, and me the same. And so I think we've got to just live that out in terms of male-male friendship and showing our male friends and relatives that we love them. That is so true, uh, and that's very eloquently said. I, I don't think I think we should all we all need to be there to support each other, but men do need to step up to help other men and to figure out how we create a world where where men can be good fathers, where they can be good members and responsible members of society, where they can contribute to the overall well being of their communities. Um, and look, I, I think here too. I think the, the, the you know and a lot of the debate around should men have their own circles or whatever it might be. If you look at the research around this, it's interesting. I uh, I think about the some uh, these two pro, this program in Chicago, which I really love, called the Becoming a Man program, mm -hmm. which and and the Working on Womanhood program, uh, which were started together or started uh, close to each other, but by effectively the same organization, with the understanding that when you get young people together to uh, in trusted circles to be able to talk about what they're going through, to support one another, to build trust with each other, that that's when healing begins. Uh, that's when people can reach past their areas of discomfort and and talk about what's blocking them from being the kind of son or daughter uh, or partner uh, that they truly want to be. And and the fact that you know it's just boys talking, or in the case of working women, had just girls talking. I think is a key part of the success of the, that program, uh, which has now been run for a number of years. So uh, there, there's a place for 
uh, for mixed gatherings. And there are also places I think where sometimes it's helpful to be able to talk to someone who's going through a similar experience or challenge. Um, and so I do think it's important for us to be to be open to that. Um, you know, Richard, as as our oh, go ahead. What were you going to say? Uh, it's just I, I I think we shouldn't be suspicious of those spaces just off the bat, which I think sometimes yeah. we are like male only spaces. But the other thing I was going to say, and this is maybe a broader point as well, we've talked a lot about family and close friends in this conversation, but the importance of just the daily interactions with people in mm. the, what are called the weak ties by sociologists, which they, they just all the evidence you know this you know this I'm sure that is that actually those weak t- the people you interact with like at just like at the person in your coffee shop or your bar or the, the bus or the that fabric is hugely important to our sense of belonging and and being seen so you don't you you're not only seen by the people close to you you're also seen by the people in everyday life there's this a lovely book by a philosopher called Jerry Cohen the book is called if you're an egalitarian how come you're so rich which is a funny mm. funny title for a very good book but in that he talks about social justice as being found not just in the structures of society but in the thick of everyday life yes and that phrase the thick of everyday life has come to be very important to me because i do think it's very easy for us to think about big structures or policies or even just our own families and so on but how you treat the person in front of you on the sidewalk in the car next to you on the street and the person sitting next to you on the bus the person just the person who greets you in the workplace the person that serves you your food the person who you serve the food just all of the, those thousands of interactions and looking someone in the eye being respect just it seems so trivial but cumulatively i genuinely think that's what makes society the fabric social fabric doesn't make itself we weave it through that so and these groups you're talking about i think they do some of that work as well it doesn't have to be this kind of earth-shatteringly close relationship it could just be that person on the street but you can you can impact the life of the person on the street right now mm-hmm. yeah that's absolutely uh, essential i'm so glad you mentioned that the small acts have big effects and they're really, really powerful. Um, you know, Richard, if I can ask you one last question, I might ask you a couple of quick rapid round ones. But I'm thinking about this a lot as as we raise our son and our daughter. I want them to be strong. I know that. What I've been thinking about is how do we define strength? Uh, and since we're talking about boys and men today, how did you raise your boys to think about what strength is? Because stereotypically, uh, I worry that we've too often told boys uh, and told everyone that strength is about being the loudest voice in the room. It's about being able to generate the most force and having the biggest muscles. It's about uh, the person who can be the most confident, regardless of whether it's merited or not. Um, How did you help your boys understand what strength was? Well, I think the key point is the distinction between strength and dominance, which you've mm. just articulated there, which is that your your strength is not determined by your power over others or your ranking relative to others. It's determined by how you treat others and your responsibility for others without mm. needing to minimize yourself. You being strong doesn't make somebody else weak unless you've misinterpreted what strength means mm-hmm. to mean dominance or or status. The only other thing I would say, and maybe here is a little bit more of a distinction, is just the nature of the world means that very often men should take responsibility for the safety and security of others. And that's okay too. And it's also okay if you want to ask, let's say, assuming you're straight, it's okay to ask a girl out, right? It's good to ask a girl out, so long as you know, you have the courage to ask her out, but the grace to accept no for an answer. And then I would add the responsibility to make sure that either way, if you're out and about, that she gets home safely. Now, you might say some of that sounds a little bit old fashioned. I don't know. And at this point, I don't really care. And I would always give my boys a little bit of a a gap on their curfew if they were taking someone home who needed their protection. That was more likely to be women, Mm. for sure. But just someone who needed their, their... And I think that's okay. And very few of the women I know hate that idea. You know what they want is men who are just who treat them as equals and as respect, and so that that's the kind of strength I think we want to see one which is based on 
being under your own steam, knowing who you are, comfort your own skin and looking out for others, especially those who are more vulnerable than you in whatever circumstance that is. So sometimes it'll be physical or otherwise. So that's, that's what I've attempted to pass on. Ah, well, thank you for sharing that. I'm taking some notes here for when I have these conversations with my own kids. So thank you. Um, lastly, Richard, what gives you hope that we can shift the tide from where we are right now, where so many boys and men are struggling to a world in which boys and girls, men and women can all thrive, can be happy, can be healthy, and can be their best version of themselves. I'm really encouraged by the attention that issues around identity, mental health, loneliness are getting, and you know, time for me to thank you for the work that you've done in bringing all of that uh, to the fore, because I so much of that underpins the other issues we're having. You can see education statistics, you can see employment statistics, but in the end, this sense of who we are in the world, and as you say, the universal need to be seen and needed, I think just so important. And so I'm hopeful that we're now having a much better conversation about that than we were before. But specifically mm. on the issue of gender, like I'm really encouraged by the fact that most people, except perhaps the real fringes, don't think there's a zero sum trade off between women and girls mm. doing better and boys and men doing better, right? Because boys and men aren't struggling because women are doing well or vice versa. We do rise together. And I've been really encouraged by the appetite that there is for people to have just an honest, good faith conversation about this and say, huh, there's a bunch of places here where boys and men really do seem to be struggling in different ways or sort of more. But but also here are a bunch of areas where we should be really worried about women and girls. And guess what? We can think two thoughts at once. We can care about two things at once. You have a son and a daughter. I think you'd be very upset with me if I said, you can only care about one of them. Mm -hmm. You're only allowed to care about one of them. But sometimes the debate has been framed in such a way around gender that it's almost that choice. People, people do not want to play the zero sum game anymore. And people can see the boys and men in their lives struggling and they want to help them. I'm, I think we're in a better place on this than we were two years ago. So the conversation's moving for sure. And I think that, that will, I think the culture and policy will, will ultimately follow, but it won't happen by itself. And back to where we were a few minutes ago, it's going to take more men to be willing to lead this conversation who are acting in good faith and who are mm -hmm. allies to the women's cause but also compassionate about what's happening to men. You can be passionate about gender equality and compassionate about what's happening to lots of boys and men. And anybody that tries to make us choose between the two is not the not our friend. Well, well put and, and a beautiful way to, to end our conversation. Richard, I, I want to thank you both for this conversation, which I found just personally uh, enriching and instructive, but just also for all the work you've been doing in the last few months since your book came out. On the space, like having written a book myself, I, I I know that it is an incredibly challenging process, uh, especially when you write a book that's as high quality uh, a publication as yours was. And so I can only imagine how many years went into it. Um, but it is now helping so many people. And my hope is that if we walk down this path and pursue this conversation, that you've helped to to spearhead and accelerate uh, for the country and and beyond. My hope is that the world will be better for my son uh, and for my daughter and for millions of other boys and young men out there who are struggling today. So thank you so much, Richard. Uh, so grateful for you. Well, thank you for your work and for your time today. Thanks for joining this conversation with Richard Reeves. Join us for the next episode of House Calls with Dr. Vivek Murthy. Until then, wishing you all health and happiness.